carried a burden for too long on my own. I wasn't created to bear it alone. I hear your invitation. condition had a plan from the start your son for redemption the price for my heart and I don't have a context for that kind of love I don't understand can't comprehend all I know is
everybody and welcome to The Gathering Online and happy long weekend. I hope you're having a great time with family, spending some extra special time together and I'm super pumped that you made this service a part of your long weekend plans because we exist to connect people to the love of Jesus and we're doing that right now. Okay, if you tuned in or came to in-person church last week, then you heard a couple of big announcements and I want to make sure they are on your radar, so I'm going to say them again just in case. Here they are. First, next weekend is going to be an amazing service at in-person church. If there's any way you can join us in person, please do because it's Celebration Sunday, y'all. Okay, news flash. Jeff is headed off on a sabbatical for a few months. So we are sending him off with a fantastic service next week, which is May 29th. Now, don't tell Jeff, but we're arranging for a way for you to bless him and his family if that's something you feel inclined to do with letters or cards of encouragement or even a financial gift. There was an email that went out this past week with information about how to give to that if you're feeling led and you can physically drop it off at the Blessing Box at church next weekend or at my house. Just reach out and we can make that happen, but shh, it's a surprise. So we'll have a special time with Jeff during the service where we can bless him and pray over him and we are also having that day a baptism. I'm so excited for this wonderful person to get in the tank. <laughs> and then after the service is done, we're going to celebrate with a barbecue. We're providing everything, hot dogs, hamburgers, drinks, etc. So plan to join us for that. And then after the barbecue, we're going to have a town hall meeting where we will lay out just exactly what is going to be happening at church while Jeff is off. And for the record, we're still having church each and every week all summer long. So have no fear, Kristen's still here. <laughs> Okay, the other thing you need to remember is that our big give movie in the park is happening on June 4th. We'll be showing the movie in Canto at Mountain Meadows Park in Riverside South. And I'm talking so fast. And we'll have popcorn and both of those things are completely free because we wanna bless our community with a free family fun night. So please spread the word about that if you please. There are ticket invites at in-person church. There's an online event that you can share on Facebook and there are about to be signs up around the community and don't forget word of mouth. So help us get the word out that we, the local church, are putting on a free movie night and it's gonna be great. So that's what's going on. You are now in the loop officially. You're welcome. Well, this morning on this long weekend, we've got the one and only Dan Chuck Reed, who is here with a message called, I am the bread of life. Spoiler alert, Dan will be filling in for Jeff while he's on sabbatical, which is super duper because we love Dan. While Dan is speaking this morning, you can follow along with his message, see scripture references, and take notes of your own with your YouVersion Bible app. Before Dan comes to speak though, I've got a few videos for you. So let's worship and then we'll read this morning's scripture. All these pieces broken and scattered. All these pieces broken and scattered. In mercy gathered, 
How sweet the sound.
All right, this morning's scripture is from the book of John, chapter 6, verses 22 to 51. Jesus, the bread of life. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the far shore saw that the disciples had taken the only boat, and they realized Jesus had not gone with them. Several boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the Lord had blessed the bread and the people had eaten. So when the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into the boats and went across to Capernaum to look for him. They found him on the other side of the lake and asked, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus replied, I tell you the truth, you want to be with me because I fed you, not because you understood the miraculous signs. But don't be so concerned about perishable things like food. Spend your energy seeking the eternal life that the Son of Man can give you. For God the Father has given me the seal of his approval. They replied, we want to perform God's works too. What should we do? Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. They answered, show us a miraculous sign if you want us to believe in you. What can you do? After all, our ancestors ate manna while they journeyed through the wilderness. The scriptures say Moses gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. Moses didn't give you bread from heaven. My father did. And now he offers you the true bread from heaven. The true bread of God is the one who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, give us that bread every day. Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never be hungry again. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But you haven't believed in me even though you have seen me. However, those the Father has given me will come to me and I will never reject them. For I have come down from heaven to do the will of God who sent me, not to do my own will. And this is the will of God, that I should not lose even one of all those he has given to me, but that I should raise them up at the last day. For it is my Father's will that all who see his Son and believe in him should have eternal life. I will raise them up at the last day. Then the people began to murmur in disagreement because he had said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph? We know his father and mother. How can he say I came down from heaven? But Jesus replied, stop complaining about what I said, for no one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws them to me. And at the last day, I will raise them up. As it is written in the scriptures, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. Not that anyone has ever seen the Father, only I, who was sent from God, have seen him. I tell you the truth, anyone who believes has eternal life. Yes, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, but they all died. Anyone who eats the bread from heaven, however, will never die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Anyone who eats this bread will live forever, and this bread, which I will offer so the world may live, is my flesh. <sighs> this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for this word and for being the bread of life. As Dan speaks this morning, speak through him as only you can. And may your words reach deep into our souls. As we prepare for Celebration Sunday next week and for Jeff's sabbatical, I pray that you would be in all the planning that while Jeff is off, you would revitalize him and that you would continue to help us thrive while he is away. Thank you for being the one we can turn to when we're in need, the one we can say thank you to when we're celebrating, and the one that is there no matter what. In your name, amen. Okay, friends, have a great long weekend. There's a couple things I wanted to say, but my words ran out. Let me just scroll back. Have a great long weekend. Okay, yeah. Okay, have a great long weekend. <laughs> really hope to see you in person next week because I don't know if I told you lately but I miss you see you soon you know it's crazy to think that it was almost 10 years ago. A group of students and I, we slaved over pots of boiling water in a crowded residence yeah, kitchen. We had set up chairs, we had prepared tables. It was orientation week at Iwata and we were preparing to welcome new first year students for an epic feast. 
and we rented a large community room in the res complex and we prepared a free spaghetti dinner for anyone who walked through the door. You know, hundreds of students came. They ate and they met others and they mingled. And our student leaders did this excellent job of welcoming students and trying to meet as many as they could. And as a way to get to know students better, we also collected names for a draw and the winners received a free pizza party. It was a fantastic event and a ton of work. And as a Christian community on campus, we were able to make contact with hundreds of students that day that we otherwise would have never met. We were able to announce our events, we helped people know that we existed on campus, and we helped students of all different kinds of faiths make connections. However, though we met hundreds of students that day, only a small handful actually stayed in touch with us and were interested in joining a Christian community or exploring faith. You know, if you want to attract a crowd, I think there's nothing like free cash or food giveaways. You know, you're guaranteed to reach a large audience. However, if you're using food as a way to invite people into something larger, like selling a product, or in my case, inviting people to consider faith, only a handful, if anyone, will actually be interested. Currently, we are in the season of spring, and I am so happy to have warmer weather. And in the church calendar, we're in the season of Easter, this time between Easter Sunday and what's known as Pentecost Sunday. And as the weather warms and hopefully the risk of COVID continues to decrease, there's a new like hope and lightness in the air. I don't know if you felt it, but people are anticipating better days ahead. Everyone I talk to is making summer plans. They're grateful for the sun. They're enjoying time with friends and family outside. We're thankful for the flowers that are booming. Dow's Lake next to my house has just been full of people taking in the tulips. And there's an anticipation of fresh and local veggies. We got our first little um, handful of local veggies this week in our, in, our, in our veggie box. For those of us who follow Jesus, we are reminded that our hope is in the fact that Jesus has risen again. And this truth is significant year round, but we especially want to celebrate his resurrection at this time of the year. With the reminder of Easter, we remember that Jesus has conquered fear, he's conquered sin, oppression, injustice, and even death itself. We serve a king who lives and reigns over all things. It's really good to be with you today. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Dan, and I am the pastor at Vitam Community Church which is a church plant that works in partnership with The Gathering. And we have a small community that is meeting downtown and we are trying to figure out what it looks like to be transformed by Jesus, to experience wholeness, and to then go and live by our faith in our families, our workplaces, and our neighborhoods. And it's so good to be with you today. I've been working on this series at Bytown Community Church called I Am. And we've been working through the I am statements in the Gospel of John. And this is the first message in that series. And today, as we discuss these statements, it's my hope that they'll ref help us reflect on the new life that we have because of the resurrection of Christ. So today's reading, which has um, probably been read for you already, for those watching on the gathering stream, it's from the story, it's from, the, the, from John 6. And to understand it, I think it's helpful to know what is happening in John's gospel right before this text. So throughout Jesus's ministry, he has been teaching and healing the sick. And along the way, a great crowd gathers to see him and Jesus turns to the disciples and he asks, how will you feed the crowd? The disciples, they have no idea. So Andrew finds five loaves and two fish in the crowd and he brings them to Jesus and he takes the bread. Jesus gives thanks, and he distributes it to the crowd. Everyone has enough to eat, and they're able to actually fill 12 baskets with the leftovers, one for each disciple. The crowd is amazed, and they want to make Jesus their king. And Jesus withdraws. His disciples head out into the sea, and in the middle of the night, Jesus walks on the water, which is amazing and a whole other conversation 
and the crowd pursues Jesus. They are attention to what words or phrases catch your attention as the story is read. A scripture is structured in a really interesting way. The crowd asks a question and then Jesus responds. His answers are not always a clear answer to the question that they were asking. And the text seems like a very odd question. Are they really concerned with the exact timing of his arrival? But we have to remember the crowd is confused. They are aware that the disciples set off in a boat. And this was gone to spend time alone. And yet when they seek him out, he's gone. How did he get here? Where did he go? And how long has he been here with the disciples? And Jesus is not interested in filling in these details. He probably knows that it would not be helpful to tell the crowd at this point that he's actually walked across the lake. And so instead, in a very Jesus way, he asks them about their motives. He challenges them and says that they're not seeking him out because of the signs that he's performed, but because they ate a feast and they were satisfied. He challenges them that they are working for food that spoils and instead he wants to give them food that will endure and provide eternal life. The crowd is only thinking about physical, temporal things. They've eaten a miraculous feast and they want Jesus to do it again. They want him to continue to demonstrate his power over the physical world in order to prove his authority to them. They're hungry, they want to eat, and they've misunderstood what the bread and the fish symbolize. The crowd seeks evidence that he is the promised one sent from God. They're looking for a sign that he is the messianic rescuer that they are waiting for. And moreover, Jesus refers to himself as the son of God. It's this like mysterious parable-like term. And in the Old Testament, it was used to refer to an ordinary human. It was used to refer to a prophet, like in the book of Ezekiel. But in Daniel 7, son of man is used to refer to the promised Messiah. The son of man is supposed to come and judge the earth coming down from the clouds. And Jesus states that the Son of Man will bring food that will endure to eternal life. And he's speaking very cryptically, especially if the crowd is just looking for another picnic. Jesus says that the Son of Man has received God the Father's seal of approval. Now, the seal is a mark of ownership and approval. To claim to have the Father's seal of approval is to state the belief that you belong to the Father. You are his son and his servant, a member of his household and his kingdom. You act and speak on behalf of the Father, like his ambassador. And in response to Jesus' statement that it is the Son of Man who gives eternal life, the crowd asks, well, what must we do? They seem interested in this promise of eternal life. They desire to hear concretely what they must do, uh, um, what they must do to be able to do the works that God has asked them. And the people are likely expecting to get the Father's approval through their own behavior and activity. They expect eternal life to be given because of doing the right things, like jumping through the proper hoops. It's like asking for the qualifications in order to get your dream job or seeing if you're eligible. They get trapped into thinking that their relationship with God stems from doing the right things. And I wonder today if you actually relate with this question from the crowd. You know, do you ever find yourself saying to God, what do you want from me? Just take a moment and think about that. Well, instead, Jesus responds that the work of God is to believe in the one that he has sent. The work that the people are invited into is just belief. Jesus is not simply teaching a new methodology, but he invites people into an act of faith. It's a faith that brings one into a relationship with God and gives us his approval and his favor. Jesus invites the crowd into eternal life, not because of what they have done or because of their good works, but because of faith. And it is revolutionary and transformational for the people. Jesus is stating that it's not your ethnicity, your religious deeds that give you eternal life. It's your heart and your belief in Christ. And further no more, it's not just your belief in God but in his son, Jesus. 
Now the crowd comes to Jesus with another question. They ask for a sign. And they want something that will help them to see and to believe. And they state that their ancestors ate man in the wilderness. And they want to know if Jesus is truly greater than the prophet Moses. And if, he's, if he is, they want him to prove it. For them to have faith that Jesus is truly from God and the one that they desire, he needs to show it to them. And they have seen Jesus multiply bread in the desert and they've been filled. They want more of this bread. They're hungry and they're longing for another miracle. The crowd have seen Jesus teach with authority. They've seen him perform miracles. And yet they struggle to believe that he is the promised rescuer that they've been waiting for. They believe that they just need more miracles in order to have faith. And maybe again, you relate with the crowd. When Jesus says to you that all he requires is faith, that he is who he says he is, do you find yourself saying, well, prove it? Have you ever asked God for a sign that he would somehow confirm to you that you are the son, that he is the son of God? Again, just kind of think about that for a moment and see if you are connecting with the crowd in this story. Well, Jesus responds to their request for a sign with a correction. And he reminds them that it's not Moses who gave them bread in, in the wilderness. Yahweh provided for the people. The father is the miracle worker and the provider for the children of Israel, not Moses. And Jesus reminds the people that it is the father that gives them true bread from heaven. This statement is very cryptic. It's not clear. But he goes on to say that the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. He's speaking in this unclear way and mixing physical images with spiritual concepts. And it's confusing to the crowd who are listening. But it can be confusing to us as well. So the crowd just asked Jesus to give them this bread. They desire the spiritual renewal that Jesus is talking about. But it seems like they have totally missed the fact that Jesus may himself be the bread that he's referring to. So he responds but very clearly just stating what he's been alluding to the whole time. I am the bread of life. Okay, so when you think about this and Jesus calling himself bread, what does that actually mean? Well, Jesus says that those that come to him will not grow hungry. They'll never be thirsty. Jesus is obviously not only talking about physical hunger. He's speaking much more holistically. He's talking about a spiritual thirst that he meets. He's drawing their attention to the fact that we often think that physical food or provision is our greatest worry or problem. He's drawing their attention to the fact that he cares about our whole person. And he seeks to satisfy our deepest needs. He's giving the crowd an invitation. The invitation is extended to us as well. Jesus says that he will not lose anyone who comes to him. He gives us a picture of the father at work drawing people to himself. God is actively working and pursuing his children, desiring reconciliation with them, wanting relationship. And it is if he is acknowledging that unbelief is natural in every human heart. Faith is a gift from God and supernatural in its nature. And it's a miracle, really, when anyone believes. It is the grace of God. But at the same time, there is an invitation for us to respond. And in this mysterious way, it's like this dance or this partnership where God draws us to himself. And yet we have to say yes to his invitation. An invitation that I believe we can also say no to. God does not pressure us or force us to be his children. He lovingly gives us the opportunity. And however, Jesus is clear that once we come to him, he won't lose us. He is faithful to take care of his children to the very end. Jesus also alludes here to his death, his resurrection, and his triumphant return. The crowd likely has no idea what he is saying, but he says that he will raise up all those who believe in him on the last day and grant them eternal life. John as an author is drawing our attention to the hope that we have in Christ that he will one day return. He will establish his kingdom and his children will live forevermore. There is no way that the crowd could develop a whole theology on the second coming of Christ from these few statements. But Jesus is inviting them into hope. He's inviting them to come to him, to seek, out, seek him out with their questions. 
with their longing and to look to him to be the solution to the consequences of sin and death. And Jesus indirectly answers their request for a sign. When he states that he will be raised up and that everyone who looks upon him will receive eternal life, he's alluding back to the history of the Jewish people in the wilderness. When the Israelites are in the desert, they grow increasingly impatient with God and disobedient. Yahweh has led them out of slavery in Egypt and promised that he will lead them to a land of prosperity and freedom. And it's affectionately known as the land of milk and honey. And the people complain against Moses and they complain against God. They're sick of manna. They're ungrateful for the provision that God has given them. And they want something different. And they're dissatisfied. And in response to their disobedience, described in the book of Numbers in, the ch in chapter 21, God sends these venomous snakes that attack the people and cause many to die. And in response, the people cry out and confess their rebellious nature and ask God and his servant Moses for forgiveness. And God instructs Moses to set up a bronze serpent on a pole. All those who look at this statue will be saved. And it's a source of rescue for the people and an act of repentance. Jesus sees himself as the fulfillment of that story. He too will be raised up to give the people an opportunity to receive forgiveness and new life because of the sins that they have committed. He's their source of hope. He'll protect them from death. His death and resurrection will be the sign that he truly is who he said he is. And this will be the sign to the people though probably not the sign that they were looking for. Remember, they want to eat. And this statement is offensive to the religious leaders who were there. How could Jesus claim to be bread sent from heaven? You know, and personally, I don't blame them. It's a bold claim to make. The religious elites are thinking in human terms. They're seeking a rescuer who will overthrow the evil Roman Empire. And they know where Jesus has come from. They know his humble roots. They know his carpenter father. How could Jesus make such a claim? And when they look at him, they do not see the son of God. They see the son of Moses. So Jesus reiterates that he is who he says he is. He says again that no one can come to him unless the father is not first drawing them to himself. He goes on to state that if they do come to him, he will be faithful to raise them up. And this teaching is so difficult for the Jewish leaders because they believe that they've already been chosen by God. Why would they need a spiritual rescue? They're already holy. And Jesus challenges the assumptions of the culture and the religious worldview of his day. He boldly reiterates that anyone who believes in him will have eternal life. He is the bread of life. And their ancestors ate man in the desert, they died. And he is the bread from heaven that those who eat of him will not die. He is this bread. And those that eat of him will not die but live forever. And he states much more clearly that he'll offer himself for the sake of the whole world, again, pointing to his death and his resurrection. Jesus boldly claims that he is more powerful than the manna that their ancestors ate in the desert. God provided for his people and he used to sustain them through the wilderness. It strengthened them and it carried them all the way to the promised land. However, the Israelites still died. The manna only fulfilled their physical needs. And this bread from heaven could not reconcile them to God. It could not forgive their sins. It was just temporal. And once physical needs and spiritual needs are contrasted in the text, if Jesus were just looking to gather crowds, you know, giving out money and food, as mentioned in my intro story, it would be a great technique. But if you want to actually experience transformation, it's a different process. Jesus is aware that not everyone is actually looking for that. Many in the crowd only see their physical needs and only want surface things from Jesus. They do not want to surrender. They do not want to obey. They do not want him to be king. They just want to be fed. And he's claiming that he is greater than the bread that the crowd is seeking. He will bring them life now and in the age to come. And through his death and offering of his life, he will reconcile people to God and bring them into this intimate relationship with the Father. The same way that life cannot be sustained without bread in the desert, we cannot experience life without him. He's also trying to help the crowd see that as they ask him for a sign, he is the person they're waiting for. He is the son of man prophesied in Daniel 7. He'll come again. And imagine how difficult that would be for the crowd to accept. Their promised king and warrior that they've been waiting for is the humble son of a carpenter. It's difficult to believe that he could be the son of God. 
So as we wrap up this passage, we're invited to reflect on who Jesus is and why he's come. Jesus has come to be provider, sustainer, and the giver of life to the world. He's come to fulfill the promises that God has given Israel for generations. He will lead them to the promised land and he will provide them with life. Jesus has come to rescue and save the world and bring all those who say yes to God's spirit, drawing them to himself. So what does this mean for us today? Well, firstly, the invitation is faith through grace. Some of you today are struggling with this idea that Jesus is the bread of life sent from God. You struggle with the idea that through his death and resurrection that he does reconcile humanity to God. And yet God's spirit is at work in your life. You have questions, hunger, longing, and you are mysteriously being drawn to faith by the doubts and the but doubts and uncertainties still remain. And you find yourself asking God for a sign. How do I know you are real? For you today, the invitation is to pursue Jesus and grow in faith of who he is. He is the one that you are seeking and the one that will ultimately fill you and renew you. And then secondly, this morning, friends, or afternoon, whenever you're watching this, you need to quit looking for other bread to fill you. It leaves you hungry and it brings death. Only Christ himself can satisfy your deepest hunger and thirst. Our culture works hard to convince us that money, travel, love, family, security, well, those are the things that make us happy. And these are the things that you need in order to be fulfilled. And yet, if that's true, then why do we experience such a longing? You know, this is a bit outdated now, but Tom Brady in 2005, in an interview with 60 Minutes, he said, why do I have three Super Bowl rings and still think there's something greater out there for me? I reached my goal, my dream, my life. Me, I think, God, it's got to be more than this. I mean, this can't be what it's all cracked up to be. And the interviewer asked, well, what's the answer? And Brady responded, I wish I knew. I wish I knew. I think there's a lot of other parts about me that I'm trying to find. You know, Tom Brady is considered perhaps the greatest quarterback of all time, the GOAT. He had fame, money, success, and praise. And yet he could sense that he was not complete. There was something deep in his spirit that was longing and aching for something more. And Jesus is offering us a life of completeness and wholeness to every one of you. The invitation today is to stop seeking this life through things that are temporal and through things that will pass away. Jesus is offering you life. And your invitation is to simply say yes. Will you do that today? Life under the Lordship of Jesus is truly the best thing. He's our source of life and he's the one who will sustain and nurture us. He is the one we are ultimately seeking. As he tugs at your heartstrings and draws you to himself, will you say yes to him? I'm going to pray for us to finish this off today. Father God, I thank you that you do not leave us alone. God, in all the places where there is hunger and there is longing deep within our hearts and our spirits, you come and you meet us and you bring down bread from heaven to nourish and sustain us. Jesus, I thank you that you are that bread. I thank you that you came and you lived among us and you healed and you taught and you did these miraculous deeds to show us the power of God. And I thank you that you died for us, even when we did not want relationship with you so that we could experience new life. Father, I admit that there are many things that look attractive and look like they bring life. And I find myself still longing and grabbing for these things. God, I pray that you would help me to remember that life is truly found in you. God, would I spend time with you? Would I seek you out? 
Jesus, would you be the thing that sustains me and would I know that you are my provider? I thank you that you are the bread of life. I pray for anyone today who is filled with doubt, who does feel like they need a sign. I pray that they would encounter you. I pray that they would learn how to turn to you in the midst of their questions. And Jesus, I pray that you would show yourself to be enough to them. We thank you for who you are. And we long for you to work more and more in our lives. We pray these things in your name. Amen. So good to be with you all. I hope you are all doing well. And may you be blessed in whatever uh, the week may bring. And we'll see you again soon. Take care. carried a burden for too long on my own I wasn't created to bear it alone I hear your invitation to let it all go I see condition had a plan from the start your son for redemption the price for my heart and I don't have a context for that kind of love I don't understand
again and again. 